Alright, go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to go ahead and we're going to worship through song to start uh, our service this morning. And we are planning on having a candlelight service at the end. So if you are a teenager and up, you'll be in here for that. And uh, you can just go ahead and hang on to your candle for now. But we're going to go ahead and start with Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And uh, the lines towards the end, it says, Teach us how to love each other. And I was struck with how... Jesus just didn't come to die for us. He came to teach us how to be obedient and how to love each other. So if you, if you miss his life and you just look at the cross, you miss all the obedience that he demonstrated towards God the Father and loving everyone. So those words and those lyrics stuck out to me this morning. And uh, we're going to sing that to our Savior, Jesus Christ.
you be safe. I thought about what to call this year's New Year's message. I try to put something together for New Year's, but I thought about what I'd call this year's New Year's message, and my first thought was this. I'm glad 2019 is over. That was my first thought for a title. I'm glad 2019 is over. Then I immediately thought, what if some folks had a great year? They're not glad it's over with. So that always ruins everything. Uh, and then uh, the next title I came up with uh, that came to mind was, I'm sorry to see it go. 2019. And uh, again, I thought, what if people had a great year? What if people, they're not sorry to see it grow, uh, go, so they'll disconnect and won't even listen uh, because they had a great year. Uh, so because they're not sorry. So I settled on this for a title, hoping for the best year ever. Hoping for the best year ever. So that's the title of the message. So, uh, uh, so that's it for this year's uh, New Year's, so to speak, message. Uh, to all of us who follow Christ the Savior, uh, hoping for the best year ever in 2020. And honestly, that's from my heart. I am. I'm hoping for the best year ever. I've had a lot of years. I'm 64. I've had a lot of years, and I'm hoping for the best year ever in my life. So, why don't we have a word of prayer, and we will jump right in. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to encourage us. I ask you to, Lord, speak to us from your word today. Speak to us. For those that, honestly, Lord, are hurt, that are hurt today, for those that are off the road and even into the weeds, I ask you to encourage all of us back onto the road for you, Christ. Back onto the road so our lives can actually take shape and be the best year ever in 2020. I ask you to do that. Encourage us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know why it is, but I'm always hopeful with the coming of a new year. I, I, I don't know whether it's just childlike on my part, but uh, it's a natural fit for many people to make changes when you think about a new year coming. Like, uh, <clears throat> that's over with, and uh, I'm going to do this different in, uh, you know, this new year. But it's... Uh, it's a natural fit for many people to make changes and rethink even perspective. Uh, I don't know whether uh, that's uh, all in my mind or not. That's just all it is, just all in my mind. But I'm fine with that, even if it's just all in my mind, just changing perspective and helping in that way. But fresh starts have helped me bring bits of change in my life. Fresh starts. Uh, I like... <coughs> whenever I get a fresh start at something, because that tells me I'm kind of in a ruddy type thing and I need a fresh start. But <clears throat> some fresh starts work well and some fresh starts don't work so well. That's just been my assessment over the years. We entered 2020 with uh, hope for our families and personal lives. We all, we all do. We want to... Uh, Honestly, everyone wants to have a good year, so to speak. But we're surrounded by uncertainty. Everywhere you look, honestly, on the national scale, on, uh, on the international scale, worldwide, all around, uh, there is uh, uncertainty. The cost of almost everything is rising. Healthcare is really unstable. And as we age, healthcare is more of a concern to me now than, than ever before. But it's, uh, it's kind of unstable where it all goes. Uh, retirement, investments, that's also a, sort of a concern to me right now. I know he holds it all in his hand, but it's still. There's a human factor to it, and it has something to do, uh, it gives me reason to pause and think about some things. So, uh, uh, more money in this time, more money than you can even imagine, is spent around security. Because of the way things are. The security, even for the New Year's celebrations coming up, 
the just multi bukus of money spent on security. If you've ever watched the New York Times, the New York, uh, uh, the, the ball drop there, and what they do for security, it's enormous what they spend uh, just on New Year's mm -hmm. celebrations for security because of the times we live. I think uh, we can be. I, I think we can be certain that that these things won't go away in 2020, some of these concerns. They've always, they seem like they've always been around us. But uh, I'm certain and hopeful about lots of things. I really am. I'm, I, I told you I'm kind of a glass half full type person. My wife calls it being a bubble boy. <laughs> but I call it being a glass half full person. I said, why would you want to think half empty all the time? Why? I, I don't. I, I think half full. So, and she goes, well, have it your way, bubble boy. But <laughs> anyway, I'm certain and hopeful about a lot of things. But the ways of the world, really, I, honestly, the way things are going to take shape, I'm not so certain about the way things take, uh, are going to take shape. Uh, in certain ways, we can look at the scriptures and say, well, this is what the Bible tells us, but, but the way, thing, how we're going to get there, and I'm not sure how things are really going to take shape around the world, I'm not so sure how. They're, they're very uncertain. The Apostle Paul, a guy that wrote loads of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul lived in an uncertain time, a very uncertain time. From early on in Paul's Christian life, as he preached that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior, he preached that, uh, trouble and problems rained down on him. Trouble and problems. If you've read the New Testament, you know he went from town to town and he had one problem after another. Is I think the pattern was, go into the Jewish synagogue, speak, preach, get drug out, punched in the head a couple times, and go to the next town. That was his pattern. Uh, and I would think after like the 10th town, I, I would think uh, like he would cringe every place he goes. He would just cringe because he knew what was coming. Uh, but that's, uh, that, that, that was what the pattern was many times. But he ran into loads of problems and they rained down on him. Those he wanted to win to Christ even. Some of those folks he even won to Christ sought to betray him. Sought to betray him. You would think those people would hold him in, in, in dear regard. But some of those folks betrayed him. Paul was forced to leave many towns by night in secret. The Apostle Paul was. For his own safety, he was forced to leave by night. Acts chapter 14, I just listed some of them. Acts chapter 14, he left Iconium in uh, Iconium being pelted with stones. Also in Acts chapter 14, he was beaten and thrown into prison in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 16, he preached, riots followed, and then he ran for his life to the next town. Ran for his life. In Acts chapter 17, Greek philosophers publicly mocked him for what he said, how silly it was <laughs> this little man <laughs> saying such silly, silly stuff. Then Acts chapter 20, he had to change plans because of a plot to kill him was found out. Acts chapter 21, he was savagely beaten and would have been killed, but the Roman soldiers showed up at this particular time. They showed up and saved his life. He was in Roman custody for two years then. Sort of for his own protection and to stop all the crazy riots that followed him everywhere. He was stuck in the legal system. He was placed on a ship and taken to Rome. Shipwrecked and finally ended up in Rome. Two years turned into about four years. All awaiting Emperor, Emperor Nero's final decision in that case. Waiting his final decision. All this uncertainty is when Paul wrote these words 
to the Philippian Christian. Hey Heidi, can you turn these lights on? They're called eyeballs. <laughs> okay, back there. So, anyways, oh, that's perfect. Now it's too bright. Hey, could you turn them on? <laughs> no, they're perfect. Perfect. So, all this uncertainty is when Paul wrote these words in Philippians that we're going to read today. We've, we've done some things on this verse before, but all these uncertainties, you would think all that that took place and then he ends up in prison, and this is where he writes from. Writes some of his good stuff in the New Testament. He writes uh, amidst all these uncertainties. And if there was a person who knew about uncertainties, it was the Apostle Paul. He knew about all that. He knew firsthand about uncertainties more than anyone knows about uncertainties. It was the Apostle Paul. Waiting on crazy, crazy Nero's decision, this entire time, Paul was an innocent man. An innocent man. Paul's life and future was extremely uncertain. Notice what he writes from the prison that he was in. He writes this from prison in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. He writes this. For to me, he says, for to me, Paul writes, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's a pretty easy one to say. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If you're thinking about a redo this year, and you'd like a redo this year, this verse would be a good one to begin with. For to me, he's, Paul says for me, he's referring to himself. For to me, if I had a choice, and I do, I'm going to make it. He said for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's a good one to begin with if you want to think about a, a redo in your own life. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die, if so happens, and, and he, it was a reality to him. He could have died in any one of those towns. He said, if I die, then I count that as gain in my life. I've gained something. Because I'm, it's like sending your, your misbehaved child to their room with all their stuff. <laughs> with all their stuff. With the, with, they send them, we send them in there with computers and, and phones and Game Boys and, uh, and their initially a little upset out in the living room but man when they get there they get there they can't even remember what happened out there they count that as gain gain paul thought this is what he really thought he's in prison now and he really thought this in philippians chapter 1 verse 21 he says for to me to live is christ and to die is gain <coughs> die is gain if you have any verse tucked in your heart, if you have any verses tucked in your heart by memory, close to you, this is a good one to keep close. For to me, you don't change perspectives in our life. You don't change perspectives. This, this thinking kept Paul grounded. This, this type of thinking kept him grounded. In spite of all uncertainty, Paul thought, felt, and lived these words. Notice a few more of Paul's words that he penned from the prison cell. And the, honestly, I don't know that he got three square meals a day, and they, they were dark prisons. They were, it was the Mamertine prison, and honestly, they were very difficult prisons to be in. But he penned these also, these words, and if you listen to him, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he penned these from prison also. Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. I don't know why he said that, but he just maybe thought just he's going to be writing to Americans that don't hardly listen many times. So he said, uh, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your, let, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. 
He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds, and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's what he also wrote from prison. It's kind of amazing that he writes stuff like that. And honestly, he was in prison a long time. He was in prison a long time for preaching, for speaking about the gospel. To every Christ follower, whatever difficulty has been dumped into your lap, and I know some of you have had some things dumped into your lap. To every Christ follower that has had something dumped into your lap, don't be anxious. Paul's saying don't be anxious about it, but he's saying talk to the Lord about it. And you say, well, that's so easy, but that's what Paul's saying. And this guy is in the slammer. And buddy, that's what he's saying. He said talk to the Lord about it, because by all means, you got plenty of time. You're in the slammer. He says, rejoice and be thankful that you have the Savior near. And then in verse 6 in that passage, it says, present your request to God. Talk to Him about it. Talk to Him about it. He cares about what you say. The Apostle James, Jesus' brother, said the same thing, kind of the same thing, in James chapter 1, verse 5. He said, if any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God. He said, talk to the Lord about it. If you lack wisdom, I can't tell you the amount of times that I have asked God for wisdom. I mean, I had about seven choices in front of me or even three choices or even one choice or even no choices and I didn't know what to do. And I can't tell you how many times I said, God, just please direct my heart. Please direct my heart. I need your help. I need your help! I've reached, uh, many times I've reached out for help from the Lord. I've reached out to other pastors for help, for just to clarify my thoughts, uh, to help decide direction on wh what I'd like to do. But Jesus said, also about asking Him, He said in Luke chapter 11, verse 9, He said, Jesus said, keep on asking, keep on knocking, and keep on seeking. And he said, the door will be open to you. The door will be open if you keep on asking, seeking, knocking. Christian, God knows all about uncertain thoughts. He knows all about uncertain thoughts. All about them. Let's close now with three thoughts from this verse 21. Three thoughts from this verse 21. Thoughts from a prison cell. Now, honestly, I don't know if it's just being me and a man, being a man, but if I, if someone wrote a book, Thoughts from a Prison Cell, I would say, oh, that sounds interesting. Thoughts from a Prison Cell. Uh, I would like to read that because people have lots of thoughts in prison cells. So, thoughts from the pokey, thoughts from the slammer. Thoughts that Paul wrote down for us to read at a later date. Thoughts. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Paul writes, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There's, we're going to close with this. Three nuggets. <coughs> three nuggets from verse 21. Three nuggets from verse 21 and Paul. Three nuggets from verse 21 and Paul, his personal life. Number one is this. I didn't give you notes. You, these are pretty simple. But number one is this. Nugget number one from verse 21a. It's personal. It's personal. Personal. Paul says, for to me. That's what he's saying. He's writing this, writing this about himself. For to me. It's personal. Personal. Folks, that's personal. For to me. It can hardly get any more personal than that. He says, for to me. This is about me now. He says, for to me. This is my opinion. For to me. Listen, if you've ever seen the Godfather movies, 
say, how could you ever use a Godfather movie in a gospel dream? And hey, listen, if you've ever seen the Godfather movies, when a rival gang shows up at Michael's house, I think this is part two, shows up at Michael's house and shoots out his windows and doors, Michael told another crime boss in anger, he told another crime boss, the attack on my house and bedroom where my wife sleeps and where my kids play and they color their pictures. I think he said it like that too. And they color their pictures, he said. He goes, the attack on that, he said, where my kids play, this was personal and not business. This was personal. So, to Paul, his life, to Paul and his life, Christ was personal. Oh, and please know that. It was so personal with him, the Apostle Paul. He didn't just know. Honestly, he didn't just know about Christ. He knew Christ personally. Knew Christ personally. Folks, there is an ocean of difference to know about somebody and to know them personally. An ocean of difference. Listen, I know about President Trump. I know about him. I know about George Washington. I've read several books on George Washington. Phenomenal books. But I don't know them. I don't know Trump. You'd think you'd know him as much as he's on the news. But I don't know them. I know about them. I know the Lord Jesus. I know the Lord Jesus. And it's personal with me. It's personal. For the Lord Jesus to have influence and power in your life, that has to be personal. For him to have influence and power in your life, it has to be personal. Let me say that again because maybe some of you missed that. For the Lord Jesus to have influence and life-changing power in your life, it has to be personal. It has to be personal. And I wrote down a little side note here. It says, if Christianity is not working for you, have you considered that you do not know Him personally? Have you considered that? Because my friends, I tell you, I know Him personally, and Christianity works because of that in my life. It works because of that. <coughs> Loads of people talk about God. Few know Him personally. Paul said, for to me. That's what Paul said. For to me, it's personal. It's personal. Most of you, many of you, know exactly what I'm talking about. It's personal. It's personal. That's nugget number one. Nugget number two is this. Verse 21 is prison resistant. Prison resistant. Prison resistant. Folks, know this about prison. Please know this about prison. Paul's writing from prison. Know this about prison. Prison will ruin your day almost every day. <laughs> I've never been hauled... I've been in prison many times, but I've never been hauled off to prison. I should have been hauled off to prison several times, I think, back. I should have been hauled off, but... Know this about prison. Prison can break your spirit. In prison, you may many times sleep. We have to sleep with the lights on. I, I visited one guy in prison. He goes, I can't. This is driving me insane. These bright lights at 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, it's driving me insane. Who can sleep, he said. He was all wired. He said, who can sleep in bright lights? Shining right in your face. And they, that, that was an intake. And so they just don't want to turn the lights out when people are coming off drugs or anything. They make them sleep with the lights on. And, and you can understand that. But you can understand him too, thinking, what do they think they're trying to rehabilitate? He had all kinds of bad things to say. And he was wired, boy. His eyes were like, like, and I'm just trying to read a verse through the door to him. And he was just wound, 
wound and but nonetheless uh, in prison you might have to leave the lights on in prison if you use a toilet it's in front of everybody <coughs> try that one on for size try that one on for size it's a shocker. If you can't, if you manage somehow to get over the bright lights in your eyes at 2 o'clock in the morning, try going to the bathroom in front of everybody. Uh, in prison. In prison, everything is taken from you. Paul said, for to me, he writes this from prison, for to me, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. Christ, he's saying, Christ is the centerpiece. <laughs> And that's how I got by. Because Christ is the centerpiece. Christ is the centerpiece. His focus point, Paul's focus point, the one he pleased the most. The bottom line of me, Paul said, was Christ. Christ! The finisher of my faith. Paul said, to live is Christ. He said, that's really the theme of what I do. He said, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. It's prison resistant. Actually, it's not only prison resistant, it's heart attack resistant. I had a heart attack, I think, about seven years ago. I think about seven years ago. But, uh, and it doesn't guarantee, uh, this, this gospel and this saying won't guarantee you'll never have another heart attack. Well, sign me up if it did. But, but it doesn't guarantee any of that. But when I was in the hospital, and they said, Mr. Brown, you had a heart attack. And I went, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Because I wasn't sick and like uh, in throbbing pain. And so I just thought, you just guys have missed it. And then they finally came back and said, uh, you had a heart attack. And so I started to say, oh, uh, okay. But my next thought as a Christ follower was, huh, that's funny. I don't know why I'm not... Frightened. I don't know why I'm not frightened. Uh, and Donna was in there, and I, I, I thought about this might be it. This might be it. Then they did all the tests and said there was no damage. And but they said, but don't think, don't think that this wasn't a heart attack. They said, 50% of the people that have what you have, this guy, because I was giving him a hard time to the doctor, oh dear Lord. <clears throat> what is wrong with people like me? <laughs> I was giving the doctor a hard time. <laughs> and he goes, Kevin, listen to me. 50% of the people that have what you have, die. And I went, oh, oh. okay, I started to get my head around that. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and he said, I want you to do what I tell you to do. Now, you know, you get with the program. He goes, you're going to be fine. But he said, you just do what I tell you to do. And stop eating eating uh, uh, wings about three times a week. So, and I said, oh, no, can't do that, doc. Can't do that. Do you have a pill that I can take? So, I'm just kidding. I complied in a lot of ways and changed everything. Changed a lot of things about it what was going on. But honestly, uh, it's not <coughs> it's, uh, heart attack resistant by way of this. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid to die. I thought this might be it. But I wasn't afraid. I knew if I closed my eyes, the scripture says if you close your eyes in this life, as a Christ follower, you are going to open them up in the presence of God. So I thought, uh, how bad is that? I feel bad for Donna now. <laughs> or, but, and I didn't say all that. You just kind of get sober. Sober. I'm not talking drunk to sober. I'm talking about you just get sober about these are very serious things. Very serious things. But I wasn't afraid about where, where we're headed, where I'm headed. So anyways, Heart attack resistance doesn't guarantee you won't have a heart attack. But anyways, to live is Christ. It's resistant to our past, to our past haunting us, to, for coming back. If you can do business with Him, it's resistance to our past. It, uh, uh, to live is Christ. Puts perspective to all these uncertain times coming. Puts perspective to it. If Jesus Christ is the centerpiece. It puts perspective to us. 
Early on, Paul had a knowledge of Christ. Please hear this. Early on, Paul had a knowledge of Christ. He really did. He had a knowledge of Christ. He hunted Christians down and forced them, Paul did, to renounce their faith. Forced them. Tracked them down. As mean as a junkyard dog. And forced them to renounce their faith. He knew about Christ. But then Paul made a personal decision to receive Christ after God had to assist him a little bit to smack him down. And uh, some people he has to do that to, to open their eyes. And Paul's eyes were open. All changed when Paul met Christ personally. All changed when he met Christ personally. Folks, I knew about Christ. I knew about Christ early on. I was raised in a Christian home. Raised in a Christian home. I heard the name of Jesus spoken every day of my life. I knew about Christ. I even had a favorable, favor, uh, favorable view of Him. I did. I had a favorable view. But when I made it personal, when I made it personal with Christ, me and Christ, and I asked Him to be my Savior and Lord and invited Him into my life, everything radically changed. Radically changed in my life. Last week, Don and I were back in Pittsburgh area, a small little town called Mount Pleasant. I don't know if you met many of you wouldn't know where it is. But anyways, it's a small little town. And we were visiting Donna's mother in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's where uh, Donna and I grew up. Tiny little town. I could drive through the town and tell you almost in every block a uh, happening that took place in, uh, in our lives. So, but we were back. We went to breakfast one morning in this little breakfast place. And at the restaurant, I saw a man that I grew up with. And when I saw him walk through the door, he didn't see me, but I saw him. And the name that popped into my mind was David. His name was David. I haven't seen him in 40 years now. The name popped into my mind, David. Uh, he was always hanging around. I've not seen him in 40 years. I barely recognize him. But that name, and I didn't know, I was kind of shaky on, maybe that's his name, but I'm not really embarrassed to go ask somebody. I, that's the last thing I'm embarrassed about. But anyways, I barely recognize him. As we begin to leave, uh, I approached him and said, uh, hey, uh, are you David? Are you David? He goes, yes. Yeah, I'm David. And he looked at me. He wasn't smiling or frowning. Just game face like, and uh, and I said, "Are you David?" He goes, "Yeah, I'm David." And he said, "And you are Kevin Brown." <laughs> game face. <laughs> you are Kevin Brown. And then he said, uh, he "said yes." And, and 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 then he said this, "I remember you." <laughs> So I'm standing here, he's sitting. He goes, I remember you. And he said, you spent a lot of time, a lot of por a good portion of your life antagonizing people. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, David, you do remember me. <laughs> you do remember me. And he goes, I said, you're right, David. I did. I did. I spent a lot of time. And then I found Christ as my Savior, David. <clears throat> and He reordered my life. Reordered my life and changed everything. And this is what I was hoping for from David. Like, yay for you! And I told him I found Christ as my Savior and He reordered everything in my life. All is different now, David, with my life. And he looked at me and said, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> and looked away. That was all I got from him. That was all I got. But honestly, uh, that was good enough. I was hoping he wouldn't 
rip open his shirt and show me the big scar that uh, that I uh, something you know something happened. I, I I didn't do that, but I was you know I've I've forgotten most of what I've ever done in my life. You know, as a kid, all that stuff. So I remember throwing snowballs in the winter time at David, and, and uh, I mean slash ice balls. And uh, <laughs> anyways. Uh, but he said you spent most of your time antagonizing people. And that's what really, that's what really he spot on. Spot on outside of Christ. That's what I did most of my life. Antagonized. Antagonized people. And I thought I was more clever than anybody. And my mouth got me in, my mouth got me in every ounce of trouble. My mouth. Until I found Christ. Until I found Christ. Paul said from prison, he said, to live is Christ. All will change. To live is Christ. Folks, that's the key truth here. To live is Christ. Number one, it's personal. Number two, it's prison resistant. You can even go to prison and write some... New Testament letter. Write some letters that will go on for centuries. It's prison resistant. And number three, it's death defying. In verse 21, Paul says, and to die is gain. To die is gain. He said it's, it's a plus. If you die, it's a plus. And that's how we should look at it. Even though it's sad because I like living. It's sad that way. But when you open your eyes, that's it. That's it. It's a plus. The die is gain. Many around us, honestly, many, many around us fear death, but to put perspective to our lives in Christ. If you are a Christ follower, it removes the power of that fear because fear creates a magnificent power, a bad power in our life and takes us off the road many times. Fear takes us, it, 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 to get perspective on that helps you solve so many fearful problems. Paul said, to die is gain. It's a promotion. To die is gain. Paul knew that what awaited him, his Savior, heaven, no more tears, as you just think, if you just read the book of Revelation and it talks about heaven, no more tears, no more rocks thrown at Paul's head, no more angry people in his face. He knew Christ is Lord of all and where he was going. Last page. For anyone coming. He knew Christ is Lord of all and where he was going. As we close today, I have to ask you this. Have you made Christ personal in your life? I'm not talking about looking and you know who the historical Jesus is. That he claimed this and claimed that and resurrected. Oh, no, 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 I believe the historical Jesus. But do you know him personally? Do you know him personally? Night and day difference. In 2020, if he is Lord and if he is personal, to you. It will affect your marriage. It will affect your personal life. It will affect an addiction if you have one. It will affect your parenting skills. If you know Christ personally, do not misunderstand that. If you know Him personally, it'll change all that. It'll change your job. I went from being a lunatic on the job. I wrote one foreman up after another on the job before Christ. I turned into the... To, they, in fact, they just couldn't understand what has happened to me. And I told them, Christ happened to me. That's all, Christ. And they just said, nah. They can't believe that. Christ happened to me. He will change your job, your neighborhood, your family life, for to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. <clears throat> or to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Folks, 
if you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, and He's not personal to you, listen, get alone and ask Him to be your Lord and Savior today. Ask Him. Start afresh. Ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. Come into your heart. The Bible says for God, in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He will be your Savior if you invite Him in. Start today. Start today. It will change your year coming. Start today. That's it. We're going to close in prayer. Father, we love you. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the Apostle Paul's testimony, and especially, Lord, that he would write that from prison, a disastrous place to be. And he tells us that he's going to live for Jesus. I love that, Lord. I love that about what He tells me to do in hard times. Live for Christ. I ask You to just speak that through our hearts, Lord. Help us to never forget that and help us to know You personally, which will help in every way facing 2020. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you for that, Pastor Kevin. What we're going to do now is we're going to um, take our candles that we were giving, given at the beginning of the service and um, if you would, make your way to the outside area of the pews here, just around the auditorium. Um, we're going to attempt, I think we have enough people to do a circle. We do. Um, but it's appropriate that the season that we're in here in the Northern Hemisphere is winter because winter is a time when creation is not lush and um, it's not flourishing. Yep, come on down, Cheryl, you're good. Um, it's pretty, winter is a time when creation is pretty stripped down. Um, it's had to adapt and currently right now it's spending all of its energy stores just on survival. Uh, we can be di become distracted by many things and we can fail to reckon with this sense of loss uh, where winter is the backdrop for us. But winter also foreshadows a time when life as we know it will end completely. When life as we know it goes, this year and at the end of all years, one will come and he comes bringing a new beginning. Beneath the fear, there is one who is the source of all life. One who comes to be with us and in us, even especially in darkness and death. He is one who will bring a new beginning. And before we have a time of, of lighting the candles and contemplation, I wanted to read to you from Isaiah 11 about the new beginning, a time when there will be ultimate peace. It says, in that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. So here we can see that creation's relationship, even with itself, has changed. There's no more biting and devouring. There's no more survival of the fittest. And we also see that creation's relationship has changed with us. There's no more fear. There's no more predatory. There's no more hunting. Verse 7 says, The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. We even have a dietary change here. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, the little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. The darkness is not the end, but it is a, new be it is a way to a new beginning. And at this time, we're going to have a time of contemplation. We're going to have, um, if Ron Beck 
if you would light your candle from the candle here and begin to pass that around <coughs> down the place, we're going to just have a, a quiet time of contemplation with song in the background. A time um, to contemplate that if you are a believer, you do have reason for ultimate peace. You will be there when Christ is reigning.